who come and join us. So it's good to meet new relatives. Amen. So I'd like to thank Pastor Joe Sweet for inviting me every year to your conference. I hope people are not getting tired of seeing me. No, no, okay. You're so sweet like your pastor, sweet. <laughs> pastor Sweet preached a wonderful message this morning. It was so un... Uh, yeah, please. It was so unfortunate that he had to end making way for me. I wish he would have just gone on and on and on, and I would have taken a break. <laughs> anyway, our God is a good God. Yes. Amen. Let's bow ahead for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before your holy presence one more time this morning. We thank you for this blessed Shabbat day, Lord where we could come and rest in you and be taught by you. Open the heart of our understanding and open our minds that we may hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the churches in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Well, for the past three days, we heard what God spoke to us concerning the destiny of the U.S. This morning I was praying and ask, asking the Lord, what should I come and share? What more? Is it to be still built up on the destiny of the U.S. or what? And as I was praying and waiting the whole morning, and uh, at about 8-ish, a saint entered into my room, and he said, this is what we shall speak this morning. And he began to talk about the army of the Lord. And I was very surprised to hear the message by Pastor Sweet this morning. He was doing like a preface, making the way, preparing the way for what I was going to share. So he has passed the baton. I will collect the baton from him. You know, in a relay race, you pass the baton from one to another. So he has uh, made the way, so now we'll take it off from there. We have heard what uh, God spoke to us concerning this nation. Okay, that's, you already know, now, know that now. Now let's look at the larger picture. What is going to happen in the entire body of Christ? What is the end time plan of God? What is going to take place in the end times? And what is our collective part in the end times? What should we do? What is our role? Do we have a role or we don't have a role? What is the role of the church? Pastor Sweet very beautifully shared this morning, touching about the role of the church. What is her role? What should she do? So we learn that. So what is the role of the church? When we say the church, we mean the collective corporate body of Christ, not any one particular denomination or not any one particular church. And by the church, we mean the true believers, not all, not all who call themselves believers. You know, everybody can call themselves believers, but only they who carry the cross and who walk after the Lord are the true believers. Such are those whom even the demons trembled. You may be a young believer, no? Even a young believer who carries the seal of God upon their forehead, the demons will see that and they will tremble. You don't have to say a word. But these are the last days in which the Prophetic anointing that has been prophesied in Joel 2, 28 and 29 will be poured out in an abundant manner. If you remember reading that scripture, 
it says, and in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon your sons and daughters, sons and daughters meaning 12 years old and below, and upon your young men and your young women, 15 years up to 29, 30 years, and upon the senior citizens. Fifty years and above, yes. senior citizens. Yes. See, God does not leave us out. Yes. Not only, you know, God has got a special double fold anointing for the senior citizens. Yes. <laughs> he knows we need that because we drag ourselves, you know. So, since we are dragging ourselves, first he gives the due of the youth. That makes us like a youth. Then he pours that prophetic anointing that enables us to dream dreams. You see, the scripture says the children shall see visions, the young people shall prophesy, and the old people. I'm sure you don't like to hear the word old people. So we'll use the word senior citizens. <laughs> so the senior citizens will dream dreams. I often wondered why the senior citizens... <laughs> I often wondered, you know, why, when it came to the senior citizens, <laughs> it says they shall dream dreams. Yeah. Why can't they see visions? Because they sleep too long. <laughs> <laughs> so, God looks at them. Oh, the senior citizens are sleeping too much. But I need to talk with them. So what shall we do? Okay, let's talk to them through dreams. <laughs> so, no matter what age group you are, you have a prophetic anointing for the last days. Amen. So we have the children, the young people, the senior citizens, and finally, the servants of God, the handmaidens of God, so the ministers of God, they too need a special anointing. Not just a pastor. You become a prophetic pastor. Not just an evangelist. You become a prophetic evangelist. Not just a teacher. You become a prophetic teacher. Not just an apostle. You become a prophetic apostle. It's no more business as usual. You have heard it very clearly spoken this morning. They look for a city not made by man's hands. So in the last move of God, the Lord himself will be the author of that anointing. He himself. He himself will be the captain of the Lord's army. He himself will dwell among his people which pastor sweet very beautifully shared this morning to make a habitation god making a habitation among us creating a dwelling place among us so that he may come to dwell in all his fullness like how it was when the fullness of god rested upon him bodily just as it was upon him so shall it be upon us and that being the case we need to pack up all our manuals all our know-hows of what we have been taught in yesteryears and throw them all into the shredder <laughs> you throw them all into the shredder 
and you rely on the Holy Spirit to lead you to speak, to teach, to prophesy, to see visions. It's no more you coming up with your own plans. No more you coming up prepared beforehand what you're going to speak. No. Those are all the yesteryears. Yesteryears. In the next move, the final move that is going to take place. You know, this is the last round, the final lap. You know, if you have watched athletics, before they go for the major athletics, they say 100 meters or 200 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters, or the 4 by 100 meter relay. Before the finals, they have the heats. So in the heats, let's say for example, recently there was the Olympics that took place, or the Commonwealth Games at Glasgow. So many nations from the Commonwealth, they all participate. Let's say for example, the 100 meters race. So there are only eight lanes where at a time eight runners can run. So let's say there are 36 runners from 36 different nations who have given their names for the game, for the race. So, but only eight people can be selected to run. So what they'll do, they have heats. So the eight are divided into various groups and they all run. So the first heats, eight person run. The first three winners are selected. And the second heat, another three are selected. And the third heat, another three are selected in the fourth heat another three are selected so now you have more than eight let's say there are 16 so another two heats they're called semi-finals or what you call semi-finals <laughs> I'm sorry I'm British you know <laughs> so in the semi-final so the eight runners run so four are selected and in another heat semi-final, eight runs, another four are selected. These four from the first semi-final and the four from the second semi-final are put together to run the last final. Now, in the heats, if you make a mistake, you didn't run well. See, there's a time limit, you know. But you made it. You can correct your mistake in the semi-final. And then you still have the finals to correct your mistake. In the finals, you either make it or you break it. You either win or you lose. There is no room for error. You must win. There's no room for error. And there's no room for a practice anymore. This is the last lap. The last lap. And we cannot afford to make a mistake. When the baton is passed from the past generation to you, you must hold the baton correctly. You know, have you seen these relay races? When the other runner comes to pass the baton to the second runner, you know, they are bending in this position. And there is a marker just about three feet away. And the second runner is looking at the marker. As soon as the runner reaches the marker, this guy will start running. And then he puts out his hand. At such, a, at such an angle and at such a cuffing position, so that when the other, the first runner passes the baton, it clutches carefully. And the baton should not rest in the far end of the palm, but exactly on the center of the palm, so that he grips and he runs. You cannot drop the baton. If you drop the baton, you miss precious moments in the race. So the clutching of the baton must be so correct. And the first runner to the second runner, they all must be in sync 
with one another. If they are not synced with one another, their speed levels, their stamina levels, their endurance level, and their understanding of each other must all be in synchronized in one unity. They cannot afford to have ego in the team. No ego. It's a teamwork. It's not, I run faster than you. You know, it's the team wins the race. When the final runner crosses the finishing line, he seems to be the hero. When the medals are presented, they are presented equally to all the foreigners. Equally to all the foreigners. Because it took all the four to finish the race. In the same manner, someone had labored in the past, someone had fallowed the ground, someone had watered the ground, someone had sowed seeds in the ground, someone has saw to it that the weeds grow into a harvest, and now you come along with just a sickle in your hand, and you don't sweat. Your job in the final race is just to rip in the harvest. Now, that's not an easy job. You need to know how to hold the wheat properly and then cut it in such a manner that it's properly harvested. You don't just simply cut the neck. You need to do that properly. This is the final race. In the final race, we need to know how to run our race well. If we do not know how to run your race well, then we'll lose the game. The pioneers who had pioneered before you have run in vain. Each and every one of us have been appointed a race. But even then, in this final lap, there is another heat that goes on, like a pre-selection. Who really is worthy? You're all in the selection process now, you know. In the selection process, everybody practices the game. <clears throat> you know, recently, there was this World Cup soccer in Brazil. Did you all watch the games? No. You miss something wonderful in your life, you know. <clears throat> we were in Israel during, uh, conducting our conference and in the evenings, we watched the games. <laughs> and we prayed. <clears throat> Shall I tell you a funny story? You know, I landed in Frankfurt Airport after our conference to go back home. And for some strange reason, I missed my flight, my connecting flight at Frankfurt Airport so I was forced to stay a night at Frankfurt. So I went to this transfer counter and I gave my passport and my tickets and they were going to put me up in a hotel and put me on the next flight, you know. So, and the lady at the counter was so friendly. Strange, you know, Germans are not like that. <laughs> she was very friendly, very helpful. So I thought I'll strike a conversation. I said, hey, how are you guys watching the games, the soccer? How is Germany doing? Oh, she said, oh, not very good. Uh, you know, they need a lot of help. Yes, we'll pray. God will help them. <laughs> this was before the semi-final took place, no? I said, don't worry. They need lots of God's help. I think she was a Christian girl. Yes, yes, we need lots of God's help. So I said, don't worry, we'll pray now. We'll pray that Germany will win. Will win the semi final and will win the World Cup. So, you know, I honestly, I was not sincere in what I said. <laughs> I was just saying it off the cuff, you know, <laughs> because she was so nice to me. 
So, after everything was over, I went back to my room. And before I retired for the night, I felt a deep conviction. So I made a promise to that lady that I will pray for Germany. So I knelt down. I said, Lord, knowingly or unknowingly, I promised that lady that I'll pray for Germany. So please, Lord, let Germany win. <laughs> let them win the World Cup this year. And you know the rest of the story. Anyway, that was the second time my prayer for a nation was answered. <laughs> now, about two months ago, I was praying one afternoon, getting ready to go and speak at a youth meeting that we conduct every month in India. As I was praying, an angel appeared before me mighty angel from head to toe he was dressed in an armor like all battle ready with a head gear with a chest gear with a sword in his hand with all full armor and he looked at me and he said this word the battle is real and the threat is real those two words the battle is real or the war is real and the threat is real. So I asked him, what does that mean? So he said, when you go and stand in a meeting, you will be given the rest of the words what you should speak. So I went to the meeting. 320 young people had gathered. And I stood up, and as I began to pray the opening prayer, I saw many warrior angels. They come and stood all over that auditorium. And the chief among them, there was one chief, and he stood in the midst of the crowd, and he looked at me and he said, repeat this word again, the war is real, the threat is real. The war is real. You know, the end time warfare is not merely a spiritual warfare. Though it is spiritual, it is not like what we have known in the yester years of merely binding and losing. Not just binding and losing. The war is real. Pastor Sweet prefaced my message, you know. He didn't know what he was speaking. But he was guided by the Holy Spirit to speak. He saw a mob crowd outside his house. He did not go and say, Peace be still. <laughs> he didn't say that. Right? What did he have under his arm? A gun. Because the threat was real. The threat was real. The danger to life was very, very real. The mob was taking place right before his house. Anytime, those bunch of weird hooligans would come into his house and attack him, attack his wife, attack his daughter. The threat is real. The threat is real. To face the threat, he went out equipped because the danger is real. Not just merely binding and losing, you know. Those are the strategies of yesteryears. In the last days, in the end times, when your enemy is no more just a principality of the power in the air, or a spiritual wickedness in the high places. It's no more right there. Where is he? Please turn with me to Revelation chapter 12. In Revelation 12, chapter 12, 
we see of a war that takes place in the heaven. Chapter 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Please underline that phrase, war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against a dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Now this scripture does not talk about the war that originally took place in heaven when Lucifer first sinned. No, that's not what it is. It is all, most of the time, wrongly interpreted that this entire passage refers to what took place in heaven before man was created. That's not correct. How do we know that? Let's continue reading. And prevailed not, neither was there place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon, now this title great dragon, was not given to Lucifer when he was up in heaven. The title came to him after he fell. So this proves again that this war is not the war that took place before creation. And the great dragon was cast out that old serpent. You see, it's old serpent. If it's an old serpent, this event cannot be in heaven. Because in heaven, he would have been a new serpent. Agrees? Just became a serpent. So that's new serpent. By now, after 6,000 earth years, he is now called old serpent. 6,000 years old. Very senior citizen, you know. <laughs> you Americans, why you people like to dupe yourselves? Anyway, <laughs> old is old, you know, right? A fat is a fat. Why call it large? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Shall I continue? <laughs> So, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Now, all this proves that this is not an event that took place original, originally in heaven. This was something later because in heaven, the devil was called Lucifer. He was not called the great dragon. He was not called the old serpent. He was not called the devil and he was not called Satan. Are we settled on this? Yes. All right. Who deceived the whole world. Now, this is something that did not take place in heaven. In heaven, he only deceived the angels. He did not deceive the whole world. Now, everybody are firmly convinced that this event did not take place in heaven? Yes. Okay, let's continue. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So where did this war take place? In the second heaven. Now why did this war take place in the second heaven? The heavens need to be cleared of illegal trespassing because the Lord Jesus is going to come in the air to catch up his bride. He's coming in the air. The catching up will take place in the air, not on the earth. So all illegal dwellings need to be cleared away because the king of glory, the rightful owner of the heavens is coming. So when the rightful owner comes, all illegal dwellings need to be removed. Illegal constructions need to be removed, cleared of everything so that when the bride is captured, she's she meets the Lord in the air. That's what the scripture says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. You meet the Lord in the air, his feet doesn't touch on the ground. So, the heavens are cleared. When the heavens are cleared, he is cast down on the ground. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, 
now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren is cast down who accused them before our God day and night and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto the death now we have a problem here the problem is this you know now put a finger in verse 11 okay now turn to look at verse 7 there was war in heaven we have no problem with that who is fighting in the war Michael and the evil angels are fighting in the war but here verse 11 says and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb who are the day here in verse 7 we read it was Michael and his angels who are fighting the war if Michael and his angels are fighting the war here it says they overcame him by the blood of the lamb now the angels of God do not need the blood of the lamb who need the blood of the lamb we do that's number one number two they and they overcame by the word of their testimony angels no don't need the word of their testimony who need we do that's number two number three and they love not their lives unto the death meaning they have been martyred right now angels cannot die agreed everybody they cannot die they can be captured they can be imprisoned they can be trapped but they cannot die but here the scripture says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not their lives unto death so who is this day tell me please who is the day <laughs> us which means when there is a war in heaven there is a corresponding war on the earth it takes place simultaneously like what Neville mentioned the first day parallel universe a war takes place in two realms at the same time and the end result of that war is victory for the kingdom of God though there was loss of lives but that loss of lives is not a loss of life in defeat but a loss of a life in humble surrender martyrdom they love not their lives unto death they freely offered their lives they volunteered who will go on my behalf I Lord I Lord I Lord they all put up their hands I remember several years ago our brother Neville shared an, a dream or a wish or an experience an interactive experience he had where he was taken to a place where he saw the army of the Lord of all young people on one side on horses and the enemy's army on the other side with all the tanks do you remember have you do you remember him okay so the Lord asked looked at the young people and said who will go on my behalf everybody put up their hands you remember the story yes. see everybody put up their hands they all are willing to volunteer not you <laughs> <laughs> it's them <laughs> they all put up their hands and the Lord looked around see among so many volunteers anybody can volunteer no but it's the Lord who chooses you can volunteer that does not mean you are qualified you must be prepared you know if you don't prepare you don't qualify it's one thing to sit here year after year you return you grow fat hearing all the words like a assurance fat lambs what good is it when you become spiritually obese you must be fit like a fiddler right with six packs 
I'm trying to work on it. <laughs> I have three working out machines in my home, you know. Every time I just look at the machine, I walk past by. <laughs> and I look at them and say, okay, tomorrow. <laughs> I've been just walking past by them for several years now. <laughs> but this is not laughing matter, you know. We must be physically fit. Besides being spiritually fit, we must be physically fit in the natural. Because, remember these two phrases, the war is real, the threat is real. Both are real. Let me re-emphasize one more time. It is not spiritual. It is physical. The war is real. The threat is real. You must learn the art of warfare. That was the word that the prophet Joel, who visited me this morning, brought that word. This generation, especially the youths, must be trained in the art of warfare. You must learn the weapons of heaven, what they are, how to use the weapons. There's, a, there's an art of using those weapons, you know. Amen. You cannot use the weapons. It's one thing to receive a weapon, but it's another thing to use the weapon. If you do not know how to use a weapon, it will kill you, then you killing your enemy or will end up misusing the authority and the weapon that has been entrusted in our care. A good example, look at King Saul. The kings had a javelin in their hands to thrust it at their enemy. But how, for what purpose did Saul use the javelin for? Instead of throwing it at Goliath, he was throwing it at a servant of God. He was throwing it at a anointed man of God. This is what we will end up doing. Hurting each other. Secondly, we will use it for our own selfish purpose. I'll give you a good example. Elisha had just received a twofold anointing from Elijah. And he comes out hoping for a great reception. And there comes a bunch of 42 young youths. Hey, say, hey, Baldy! Hi, Baldy! How are you, Baldy? <laughs> no offense to such who are here. <laughs> as soon as Elisha heard that, he was so angry, he commanded, come out! And two ferocious bears came out and killed all these 42 youths. What was the purpose of that? What was the purpose? Ego. Ego. That was the purpose. Ego. The anointings of God, the power that will be entrusted in this end time generation. You know, let me tell you one thing. We have not seen anything yet. The powers of the age to come. We don't know, we don't understand what it means. It is more than the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. It is more than the seven spirits of the Lord. It's more than all this. What they are, I quote what an angel once told me, even we have not seen it yet. You know, several years ago, I was invited to speak at a conference in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And on the afternoon when I was waiting on the Lord, four angels visited me. 